We are going to greet people who may be watching this message and the scripture reading online in the weeks or months ahead. It is February the 13th, 2022. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Coombs. Nancy is going to bring the scripture passage to us this morning. The scripture this morning is from Isaiah 61, 1-4 and Isaiah 62, 1-5. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the suffering and the afflicted. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to announce liberty to captives, and to open the eyes of the blind. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of God's favor to them has come, and the day of his wrath to their, their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, praise instead of heaviness. For God has planted them like strong and graceful oaks for his own glory. And they shall rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities long ago destroyed, reviving them though they have lain there many generations. Because I love Zion, because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I will not cease to pray for her or to cry out to God on her behalf until she shines forth in his righteousness and is glorious in his salvation. The nations shall see your righteousness. Kings shall be blinded by your glory, and God will confer on you a new name. He will hold you aloft in his hands for all to see, a splendid crown for the King of Kings. Never again shall you be called the God-forsaken land, or the land that God forgot. Your new name will be the land of God's delight and the bride, for the Lord delights in you and will claim you as his own. Your children will care for you, O Jerusalem, with joy like that of a young man who marries a virgin, and God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom with his bride. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Nancy. I've had the joy of presiding at uh, well over a hundred weddings in my ministry life. And uh, each one is unique and special in part because of course, each couple who I marry is very unique. And I'm often surprised at weddings because of some of the things that I've witnessed. When I was in London, Ontario, at Metropolitan United Church, it's quite a large old church, a fairly dimly lit. And I had this wedding uh, we would have this one family, they were called the Farkel family in our church. We didn't tell them that to their face, but they were quite unorthodox and they would come in in very, very um, elegant kind of gowns. Like one time I had a wedding party of 32, 16 bridesmaids, 16 groomsmen, if you can believe it. And all of them had those princess dresses, you know, those big ones. It was wild and over the top. But they loved using our church because it had this big long aisle and the bride and groom could walk down there, you know, all of splendor and so on. One time, the lights uh, in all of downtown, the electricity in all of downtown London went out two hours before the wedding was to be um, performed in the sanctuary. And because it was so dark in the sanctuary without the lights, we determined that we needed to move it across the street to Victoria Park uh, because well, it was the only place there was where there was enough light. As the bride was walking down the that that kind of the well, how would you say it? You know that impromptu impromptu aisle that we created in the park. I looked over at the groomsman. I said, "Do you have the the ring?" And he said, "Oh, I forgot it." So that meant that we had to go to the matron or the maid of honor who had a ring. And we got the ring from her. And of course, 
When the groom placed it on his bride's finger, she realized this was not her ring. That was kind of a, a sad affair. There were some tears there. There was one wedding in Lillooet where it was just kind of a couple and myself and a, a few other people, you know, friends and family. And all of a sudden, just midstream in the vows, she slapped the groom right across the face. And she said she was getting a mosquito, but I'm not sure that was really the case. <laughs> now, every wedding I've been to, there's always someone who cries. Sometimes it's the bride, sometimes it's the groom, sometimes it's both of them, sometimes it's the parents or family members or friends. And, and, and they're, of course, not tears of sadness, they're tears of joy because weddings typically are, uh-oh, Barb is shaking her head. <laughs> There's some tears starting to happen in our church here. You can't see it online. Well, you know what? I've, I brought along this photo. Can you see that? Oh my gosh, look at that. Oh wow, yeah. That was, uh, we haven't changed much, have we, honey? Flowers in her hair. Remember that song with flowers in her hair? What's that? Are you, if you are going to San Francisco. Anyways, we never made it. We got to Seattle. That was as far as we got. Anyways, uh, that was a special moment for Connie and I. And it really is kind of a, a celebration of what we would consider to be love's highest kind of aspirations where you would find such love in someone else that you would decide that you would spend a long time or a short time, depending on how things go, uh, with the person who oftentimes, you know, you don't really know that well and you find out all sorts of things later on in the relationship. That can bring about some tears too, can't it? But joy is a hallmark of weddings because they mark the passing of time. They also often celebrate one generation growing up and another generation growing older. For many of us who've gone to weddings over the past decades, we recognize how time goes by so quickly. Isn't it so true? Boy, oh boy, it is. And that can produce some tears as well, I expect. But mostly, tears at weddings are tears of joy. Weddings, I've found, are much more than just two people tying the knot, so to speak. It's about an expression of hope for the future and deciding to go through life with all of its ups and downs together knowing that there will be both times of great joy as well as times of great pain, sadness, and even loss. When two people stand in front of a justice of the peace or a minister and repeat vows and words of support to one another, do you ever think they pause to think of that famous line that probably most of us have said if we were married, for better or for worse? You know, you kind of say that so glibly, but you don't really pause to think, that there could be worse. You always think that, and you long for, you pray that things are gonna be better, but of course, they are for a time. But frequently, there's also some really tough times. Do you think for one moment at the front of Cliff Avenue Church, in the presence of 250 people where Connie and I got married, Cliff Avenue in Burnaby, and you know that, uh, that Bonnie ever imagined that there could ever be a day with Ed that might not be perfect or beautiful? <laughs> I don't think so. Look at her expression on her face. I mean, that is a woman so in love, she knows that nothing is ever going to go wrong with her groom. See, tears of joy coming again as I remind my wife of that auspicious day. Now, there's something within all of us that longs to experience joy. And weddings typify some of the most joyful gatherings we ever experience and witness in our lives. Today, I think our souls are craving to experience joy again. After all, we continue to be under the COVID-19 cloud of darkness and the ripple effect it's had in exacerbating the fraying social fabric of our nation, or if we know personally people who've you know, had COVID-19 or passed away from COVID-19 or suffered in some area of their life because of the COVID-19 crisis, boy, oh boy, it's been a rough two years. And I think we could all use a little more joy. I think we're hungry to experience joy. 
Joy is one of the greatest gifts God gives to human beings. And the expression of joy might just be when God is most pleased. When we're joyful, I think God is joyful. Rob Bell, a pastor down in the States, says, God takes great pleasure in human beings living as we were meant to live. Living as we were meant to live. We were meant to live as creatures who enjoy the love of God and experience the joy of God and the joy that comes in living. It doesn't mean that life will always be joyful, but it does mean that God takes delight in seeing his creatures, his human creatures, experience love and joy. Now, experiencing the joy of life doesn't rule out suffering, as I've said, or going through seasons of loss, struggle, or pain. In fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that life won't always be easy or carefree. It seems to come with the territory. But the kind of joy God speaks of and desires for us to experience has the power, in actual fact, to transcend struggles and even the difficulties that we experience in life. Jesus is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 16, 17, talking with the disciples on the night that he would spend his last hours with them before he would be taken away in the Garden of Gethsemane and crucified the following day. And even though Jesus knows what the future will be and what it will be not only for him personally, but the loss and the pain that his disciples and the wider followers would go through, Jesus wants to encourage them and he wants them even to experience comfort in the midst of pain. And that's why he says, I have to go because the Holy Spirit must come and he's the great comforter. So in other words, yes, you're gonna have sadness, but God promises to bring you and give you the Holy Spirit so you might find even comfort in the midst of sadness and joy even in the midst of difficult days. There's a, way, there's a time way back in the fifth century BC when the people of Israel needed to experience joy, but there wasn't much to be happy about. The nation had experienced so much grief and disruption in the previous 70 years after Babylon had come, Babylon was a huge empire in that time, and it had come down and it gobbled up the northern empire, and then it had gobbled up the southern empire, or not empire, but southern parts of the nation of Israel. And they sacked Jerusalem, and they took away thousands, probably tens of thousands, of Jewish people back to Babylon so that they could be slaves and servants. Kind of, that was the way that they cleared the land for the Babylonian Empire to expand. They would take a lot of the people who were nobility, the rich class, the educated people, the priests, and all of those people would go back to Babylon. And so it was a time of great devastation. But now the Jewish people were allowed to go back home because there was a new emperor on the scene. And upon returning to Jerusalem, after all those long decades of being away, they're rebuilding the city, they're repairing roads, they're rebuilding walls, and getting back to farming and trying to make life as good as it could be as they remembered it. And don't forget, some of them who were going back to Jerusalem had never been there because they were born in Babylon. The family members had died in Babylon. And so now this is all fresh, but it's all so very difficult. And they have depleted their joy reserves. There's not much to be joyful about. And so in the wake of so much heartbreak, I assume they would have been reflecting on what had gone wrong the decades before. Some of them must have thought, why did it seem that God had abandoned them? Why had so many died in this foreign land? Many would have asked, do you think that there's a God who really cares for us or is concerned about our suffering? Do you think there's a God who longs for us to experience joy and hope? I'm sure those are some of the questions that went through the people as they tried to rebuild that city after so much destruction in their nation. Now God hears these complaints and this heartbreak, kind of the heartbreaking stories of these people who are trying to build Jerusalem back up and rebuild a nation. And God understands the people, God cares for the people, and then God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, some of those words that you heard Nancy speak of from Isaiah 61 and 62. And it's a message of hope and renewed joy. Isaiah was a prophet to the people of Israel during some of his darkest times. 
he's considered to be the greatest prophet of the Hebrew people. Now, prophets in those days had a really tough job because typically they were not bringing good news to the people. Usually they were trying to get the kings or the leaders to get back on track with God or to listen to God's pleas for them to obey him. And, and frequently, of course, because those people aren't too much different from people today, they didn't like listening to God and they didn't like listening to cranky prophets. You don't like listening to cranky preachers, do you? Well, you've never had one cranky preacher in me, but you might have experienced it in the past. I don't know. Let's not go there. Anyways, most prophets were pretty cranky, and people oftentimes did not want to hear what they were saying. The first 39 chapters of the book bearing Isaiah's name are filled with pronouncements of God's coming destruction in both the Judah and Israel. Kind of, They were two provinces that made up the nation of Israel. But the final 27 chapters are filled with the message of hope and consolation and even joy as we find that was read from Isaiah 61 and 62. In the face of the people's hunger for joy, they hear these words from Isaiah. God has anointed me to preach good news to the suffering afflicted. God has sent me to preach good news to comfort the brokenhearted. To all who mourn in Israel, God will give beauty for ashes, joy instead of mourning, and praise instead of a spirit of despair. And then in the next chapter, that's from Isaiah 61, in the next chapter, Isaiah talks about how God is planning a wedding. In essence, the prophet is saying that God will show up dressed like a groom, and the bride, who will the bride be? Well, the bride will be the people of Israel. Because God delights in you, Isaiah said, and rejoices over you like a couple getting married, because God loves the people. They are God's delight, and so God will turn their mourning their sadness into joy and gladness. Now, what do you think God sees in us when we go through bad days or feel desperate or that our joy reserves are just so depleted, there's nothing left? When we're tired and cranky or when we're floundering in a time of grief, do you think our lives are defined by our worst days or by our best days. You see, if the nation of Israel was defined by its worst days, well, they would never have had books written about them that would have stood the test of time. God saw them, yes, in their worst days, but God loved them even in their worst moments. And God wanted to bring them to a place of greater joy and healing and wholeness and grace and love. Now, what does God see in us? Well, we're definitely complicated creatures. I know that personally. I married Connie, very complicated woman. I know. She loves those little moments when we have this thing going on between us in church. Anyways, I expect that God sees... Uh, anyways, I expect that God sees a mixture of things because each of us is capable of producing so much beauty and joy and love, but also we can be mean-spirited or petty or withhold love. In all of this complexity, God longs for us to experience grace, love, and joy and consolation when days are tough. Because when God looks at us, Isaiah says, the divine heart of God is actually filled with joy. Do you think today in our time of difficulty and discord in this nation, God might want to remind us of how much love and joy he still finds in us? And how such knowledge might actually produce fresh joy and hope in our hearts. In other words, if you start to believe that God actually finds great joy and delight in you, even when you're kind of messed up, even when you're sad, God still actually finds great joy and love, just like a parent. A parent who knows that a child is going through pain and suffering and sometimes imaginable, unimaginable heartbreak, that parent still loves that child and wants to have them experience so much more, including joy in their lives. This is what God does. God takes delight in us even in our worst days. I know it's hard to imagine, but this is who God is 
revealed in Isaiah in these passages of scripture and certainly revealed in the life of Jesus. In my office at work, I have a picture of Connie and I taken some years back. I could go get it, but just you can see it after. And uh, we've changed over the years. Of course we have. Everyone changes over the years. You grow older and sometimes uh, life isn't always easy on us, either emotionally or mentally or physically but we all have to grow older. The people in that photo in my office are the same people in this picture. And we've changed, of course, as I said. When I think back to our wedding day, we had no idea of the happy and hard times that lay ahead. That smiling couple that you see there, I know it's hard to see, isn't it? That smiling couple that you see there 41 years ago doesn't know that in the years ahead there's going to be heartbreak. They're going to go through some really, really tough times that will last not just for a week or two, but will last for a very long time. And of course, along the way, we will lose friends. We'll lose family members. We will experience challenges in our relationship and with our kids and in our churches. I wonder if Connie and I would still have joy on our faces in those wedding pictures if we could kind of peer into the future and see the things that might happen. Because if you could only see the bad things that would happen, no one would ever get married. No one would ever fall in love. Because you know when you fall in love, or when you experience love and grace in a family, you know there's always gonna be some kind of thing that's gonna disrupt that or it's gonna be broken. Now you might think that maybe we were naive when we got married and probably we were. And you think joy like that that we experienced on that wedding day could not last. And when I look back on my own life, I remember sitting, thinking and pondering about those times, particularly when they were tough, when joy wasn't there or not easily found. And what my Christian faith did for me and what I hope it does for you is to go back and look at the family photo album. You see, when I see that picture of Connie and I, even if I'm having a crappy day, I think, wow, you know, that was a wonderful moment in our lives together, and it produced so much joy and love in the years that followed. And I would go through everything again, even the tears and heartbreak, because love with Connie and I is such a beautiful thing, and I really appreciate that. So I kind of go back in the family photo album, if I could, kind of metaphorically speaking, in my faith journey. And I pull out some of my old journals and I read through some of the stuff that I went through before, particularly in the tough times. And I see how God's favor was upon us. I see how God brought us through tough times. I, I write down and have written down those times when God produced a miracle in our lives. And it reminds me, oh, God is there. God cares for me. God loves me. God loves my family. God loves the church. Therefore, I'm going to get through this rough patch in my life as well, and I believe that God will restore my joy. Or I look back and I think of uh, people who have been married for years, find themselves in times of great need, or a single person who's experienced all the triumphs and disappointments of life, and, and then they share with me when I'm in conversation with them, some of the painful things of life, of course, they do. But frequently, they share with me some of the most wonderful times of life that they ever experienced. And it's sometimes all you need to restore your joy is to remember the blessings and the love that you've experienced in your life, and something starts to rekindle a fire in your heart to say, I can still experience joy today. I can still experience love today. Because I look back over my life, and yes, there were hard times, but for most of it, there were wonderful times of love and blessings of God, and God was there for me always. Now, it's not like those conversations when I have them with people, it's not like they haven't experienced rough times, because we all do. But the question is, have they found joy in the midst of loss or pain? Have they experienced the comfort of God and perhaps even the joy of God that passes all understanding that carry them through those times of loss? Does the joy and hope of God's delight over them provide them with comfort during rough patches in their life? And can we find joy instead of mourning 
like Isaiah prophesied? Can we find praise instead of a spirit of despair? Because if you can find that, then I know you are on the path to actually experiencing greater joy and hope, healing and comfort, because that's what God wants to give to us. The prophet Isaiah is looking at this group of tired and uncertain people trying to rebuild their lives after a time of great turbulence in the nation and great loss and stress. And here God's saying in a still small voice, why don't you remind them of how I see them? Why don't you tell them about my vision and what I'm going to do? Why not remind them of my love and the grace and the joy that I brought into their lives and that I will restore once again? As I say every now and then when I'm feeling bad, I look through family photos or I look through my journals or remember a time when we were in a congregation and we were at a wedding and we were all celebrating together like Bob and Jan. I think of Bob and Jan, one of the most fun weddings I've ever been to in my life. Of course, family weddings are always fun too. I also think of funeral services that I've done. And of course, it is a time of great sadness. But I have also found in some funerals, some of the deepest moments of joy and gratitude for a person's life that was well lived and how that person had blessed so many people. It turned from a funeral into a joyful celebration. This is what Isaiah is saying. We all long for new joy. We've experienced crappy times the last two years. We need to experience joy, but sometimes you just need to be reminded past events where God has blessed you, that God finds great joy and delight in you. The pandemic has made it tough for most of us, especially those who've gone through grief and loss. But I'm going to encourage you, pull out the family photo album and see God smiling down at you. Remind yourself of the happy times. I want to remind you also that God is with you and God still finds great joy in your life, in your life. Those friends online, God still finds great joy in you. And I hope in the knowledge that God finds great joy in you, it will also stir in your heart something that also will burst forth with greater joy and praise to God as well. He delights in us like a bride or a groom delights in the love of their wives on a wedding day. Sometimes what we need to make it through tough times is a reminder that we're loved, that we're held in the everlasting arms of a loving God, that God takes delight in us and longs to see us through till our joy is once again restored. Facing discouraged people, Isaiah gives them a reason for joy and hope. Here you see God, he says, smiling like a bridegroom on the wedding day. Here you are, your family and friends are gathered together. You're the reason God has called everyone together because it's a wedding celebration. And he says, you will not be called desolate or barren or a broken land. No, you will be called the bride of God. And that gives the people hope. And it gives them strength to carry on and to rebuild the nation and to once again restore the glory of the Lord in the midst of the people. In the week ahead, will you remind someone that they are God's delight? Will you help them to see that God's face is turned towards them and that despite the pain of the last months or years or whatever they've gone through, God still wants them to find joy and know at a very deep personal level that they are God's beloved. Amen. God, I thank you for the passage from Isaiah and the reminder that you delight in your children and that you long for us to experience renewed joy and love and laughter even after a long spell of heartbreak and discomfort. And so help us to be joy givers in the week ahead and to experience the joy of the Lord today.